Well, amen, amen. Fresh water. You probably want a fresh message too now. Well, amen, amen. Well, good to be saved. Good to be in church. I broke the microphone. Hang on a second. A little bit of pleasure. You learn to hate these things, what you learn to do. They all are all different. They got like some of them got one switch that goes down, the other one goes one down and one over and this way. One mute says on, and the other says, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's the same people update my phone, actually. And so um, that's it. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to mention anything about the book table, except I never thought about this. <clears throat> I have never given you people our guarantee. I mean, Daystar is right here, and you guys haven't gotten the guarantee. And so uh, everybody wants a guarantee, so here's what it is. If you buy anything whatsoever, I don't care what it is, off the book table, and you are not 100% satisfied, tough. <laughs> this ain't Walmart, okay? I'm serious, you know. I tell them, my name's Sam, but it ain't Walton, all right? I, uh, in fact, in fact, if you if you buy something on my book table and you're not satisfied with it, take it back to Walmart. They'll take anything back. They don't even know. When we get low on money, I'll take some of my books back to Walmart. <laughs> Why do you sell this guy's stuff? Anyway, but um, no, that stuff's back there. You can grab it if you want uh, after church. I have a policy. I tell them every place I go, they think I'm joking. And I said, uh, policy is anything you get under your coat's free. So now don't do it in front of us. We're not that dumb, but uh, anything you want. I was in a church one time, and a, and a guy says, no, don't you want to cover this when you're not here? You know, like with a sheet or something? I said, why? He goes, well, aren't you afraid someone will steal something? And I was a thief. I would be afraid of that. But I said, uh, I said, okay, so somebody steals. Uh, I mean, let me explain something, okay? You know, we lived in motorhomes, and I love my wife. And and uh, we'd put the, she'd say, the bin. I was, she'd lock this bin. And I'd say, why? She goes, my laundry soap's in here. I said, babe, I was a thief. I said, you think any of us guys are going to get together and go, hey, man, I just stole some dash. <laughs> and and right behind laundry soap is probably books. I mean, Christian books. I mean, you're a thief. You want to steal a Christian book. But I figure, well, if they steal the book and get right with God, the job got done. Uh, we're going to go just for a second. <clears throat> we're going to go for a second to um, Romans chapter 15. And then after that, we're going to jump over to the book of Job. And we'll spend the evening in Job. Pray for us. We leave, uh, we get up about four, head for the airport tomorrow. I got a guy picking me up about one. Uh, no, no, I'm probably one in the afternoon at the airport when we get back in. <laughs> Brother Grice Brother Grice is back there going, what? <laughs> he said, well, when I show up at four, you're not going to be there. Then. But, um, uh, but anyway, so, uh, uh, but pray for us. We had, we got a busy week. My weeks are usually busy. We kind of keep busy. We like that. All right. Um, <clears throat> Romans chapter 15. Uh, look what it says. This is a declaration from God. It says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime. Um, really, there wasn't a whole lot of New Testament written at the time he, he wrote this. Uh, obviously, he's referring back to what we know as the Old Testament. Uh, for what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And let me explain, uh, let me explain the difference between um, faith and hope, okay? Because there, there is a discernible difference. Um, if you got arrested, uh, they said you robbed a bank and it wasn't you or whatever, you know, you would say this, I have faith that the Lord's going to get me out of this, right? And then your lawyer comes in that afternoon and says, look, I'm filing this form, and the judge is going to see it about an hour from now, and that's, that, that should be getting you out of here. All right, you have faith that the Lord is going to get you out, but when you say, this form, that's my hope. You understand? In other words, we have faith that the Lord's going to take care of us, correct? But our hope is that he's going to give us a million dollars. Uh, well, anyway, uh, but really, our, but our hope, if nothing else, our blessed hope is he's going to bail us out of here. He's going to get us out of here. But, but if you ever said, oh, man, we need some help, uh, and you got, but I trust the Lord. He's going to take care of us. And then you see something on the horizon that may be your deliverance. Then you focus your hope on that, okay? That's not my message. I just want to tell you that. Um, 
In the book of Job, uh, I, I am uh, always kind of amused by the book of Job. You say, why would you be amused by the book of Job? Well, it's not the book of Job that amuses me, it's Christians. Uh, don't we say that, that there are 66 books in this, in this Bible, and God is the central figure of every book? Right. I don't know of many Christians ever go to Job looking for God, or looking at God. What do they go for? They go for Job. Why? Well, you know. Only Job would understand what I'm going through. You know, my car is getting bad mileage. Only Job would understand that kind of grief. And we always go to the book of Job looking at Job. Uh, there's also a, a, this is why it's funny. Uh, I talk to Christians. You ever hear those people that say this? Uh, well, I don't read too much of my Bible because I don't want to become so heavenly minded. I'm of no earthly good. You know what I found? I found so many Christians have found a shortcut. Like they found a way to be up no earthly good and never did get too spiritually minded. And they'll say, uh, well, you know, I don't want to get so, so, uh, so, you know, so close to God that the devil asked to do to me what he asked to do to Job. The devil didn't ask anything. The devil didn't bring him up. God brought him up. You know, you don't have to go there, but in Job chapter 41, you know, I, I try to explain to people that this, <clears throat> this contest, this contest between our God, the God of the Bible, uh, and Satan, uh, sometimes uh, people look at it like it's a great big arm wrestling contest. And, uh, you know, like, oh, look, something bad happened today. The devil's winning. And, oh, look, something good happened today. God's winning. Guys, that's not the case. Think about this. Um, our God whipped the devil twice. You know, I was, uh, I was youth director, and I, and I told my teenagers, I said, now, uh, back, in, back in the 70s, 19, 19, 70s, but um, back in the 70s, uh, it, was, it was rare that you would find an atheist that would admit it, and really hard to find somebody who said they was a devil worshiper, a Satan worshiper. But when you did, they really played it up. You know, they kind of they kind of lived in a house that looked like a haunted house and dressed like a cross between Vincent Price and Lurch, and, uh, and they would come to the door kind of like this, you know, And, when, they, and when, when you said you were, you know, you worship the Lord, they wouldn't say. Do you ever notice these people, they ever say, well, you worship the Lord, I worship the devil. They go, I worship the devil. And before long, the Christians are going, oh, oh, stay back, stay back. And so I told my young people, I said, um, if you're ever door knocking and you run into a Satan worshiper, and he says he worships the devil, say, too bad you picked a loser. And if he says, what do you mean? Say, my God whipped your God twice. He whipped him once in Isaiah chapter 14. Is that not true? But, but do you ever notice whenever there's a heavyweight championship fight and, and one guy wins, the other guy doesn't say he won. What's the other guy say? I want a rematch. So they had a rematch in Matthew chapter 4. And, and uh, let me explain this. Uh, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but what if you were the, uh, you were the challenger? You're taking on the heavyweight champ, uh, and you're the challenger. And, the, and, and they asked the challenger this. They said, uh, they usually say something like this. How do you think the fight's going to go? And the challenger says something like, I'll go knock him out in a three row. That's about all the farther you can count. And if you were the challenger and you said, I'm going to, they go to the champ. They say, champ, he said he's going to knock you out in the third round. How do you think this is going to go? And he goes, well, you know, I'm going to win. I mean, that's, that's a foregone conclusion. But I want to give this kid a chance. So here's what I'm going to do. For 40 days and 40 nights before the fight, I'm just not going to eat anything because that way when I get in the ring, I'll be real weak, and that's the only hope this kid's got. Man, if I was a challenger, I would get out of Dodge, okay? And you know what your God did? Let me you this, this? You think it's this? Oh, no. Your God, the second on the rematch, didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. So Christians are amusing. They are amusing. They, uh, they you know, you say, well, you know, if you didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights, you'd really be spiritual. You'd really be hungry. I have some preacher friends, and they fast for 40 days uh, at a time, which I think is wonderful <coughs> that they do. In fact, anybody would like to do that, let me encourage you, fast for 40 days, 40 nights. See how easy that is? But I am not going to do that, all right? I, I told one of them, I said, brother, the Lord only did it once, right? What are you going to do, be out spiritual with the Lord? I had, a, I had a pastor friend call me one time. He was really down, and he goes, Pray for me, brother. I said, what's the matter? He goes, 
I need to get an answer from God. He said, I'm looking to hear something from God. And he said, I just finished a three-week fast. I didn't eat anything for 21 days, and I never heard a word from God. And I said, thank you for telling me. He said, why? I said, because now if I ever need to hear from God, I'll know that fasting for 21 days, don't get it done. Okay? I mean, I'm, look, I believe in fasting. Okay? I just don't think it's magic. But um, I look, guys, I may not hear from God, but I'm going to not hear from God with a burger in my hands. All right? That's just, I'm not going to hear from God. I may as well enjoy that. And, and here's what happens. You get over to, to, to Job chapter 41. Don't, you don't have to turn there. Ah, eh, go turn there, turn there. It's all good. Job chapter 41. Listen, if I preach too long tonight, just don't come back tomorrow. But look at Job chapter 41. Look what it says. Can so draw Leviathan with an hook or a tongue which, uh, uh, with a cord which thou lettest down? You know what he just said? Can you catch the devil like a fish? That's what God said. He said, you don't want to catch the devil. I can catch the devil like a fish. Uh, will, he make thy, make, make, will he make many... Sub, oh, no, I'm sorry, verse 2. Can thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Unto thee? Every time I hear that, will he speak soft words? You know what we hold the guy down? Say uncle. Let me up. Say uncle. Make him say something nice. <laughs> That's what God can do with the devil. And so I told my young people, I said, you know, tell them they, they worked the loser. I had these two girls. These two girls were like little butterflies. They would not hurt anything. And we had visitation night one night. And the kids are all coming back in. And these two girls are coming in. They are giddy. I mean, they are giggling. They can hardly, they're, they're almost hard to compose themselves. And I said, I said, what happened? And they went, we found one. I said, you found what? A Satan worshiper. I said, well, what was it like? They said, it was just like you said. A guy lived in a house like the, the house you see at the opening scene of a horror flick. You know, the people go in and never come out again. And they said they were terrified. They're, you know, they go to this door. They didn't have to knock. They just held their hand there. It just jittered enough. And they said, sure enough, man, this guy came to the door like this. Right? <laughs> they said, we saw him. We were scared to death. And he goes, what do you want? And he's going, well, we're for the Mass and Baptist Temple. We're just knocking on doors to tell people about Jesus. This is exactly what he did. He said, well, I worship the devil. I said, what'd you guys do? They said, we both smiled. I said, what did he do? He said, he went. And this little girl, little girl, she goes, too bad you picked a loser. What do you mean? They said, well, our God whipped your God twice. In Isaiah chapter 14, he whipped him. Then he fasted 40 days, whipped him in Matthew chapter 4. And is this not true? There's one more scheduled bout. It's, it's, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's scheduled for a valley in Israel. And if you say you're saved, you're betting your soul on who wins that. Isn't that right? And so our God can play with the devil. And I think, I, I really do, I really think this is what happened. This is how the book of Job came into being. On one particular day, just because he felt like it, when the devil's going to show up, God says, you know, I think I'll put a stick in the devil's eye. You say, why don't you do that? Because I can't. What's he going to do? Get mad at me? I whipped him twice. What's he going to do? And he came up there and he baited him. And the devil took the bait. Man, if I could get a fish take bait like the devil took the gourds, it was good. Look what it says, oh, verse uh, 6, chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered and said, Answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Who brought up Job? God brought Job up. Say why? Because Job is the stick that he is going to put in the devil's eye. You know, I don't know if you, 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 you fear this. Well, I don't want to have happen to me what happened to Job. What happened to Job is probably one of the greatest compliments God ever paid a mortal man. Because, you know, you know what I fear? You know, if this whole thing comes apart and we end up in jail or whatever the case may be, you know I'm afraid of it. I'm not afraid of being in jail or whatever they're going to do. I'm afraid I'm going to embarrass them. I'm afraid I'm going to shame them. 
You know, I talk to so many people. Do you ever know talk how many people are going to die for something? They, these, we got Christians who will die for 85 things. And they're willing to die for everything. And I never get too, uh, I never get too encouraged when some guy's ready to die for 50 or 60 things. Just trust me, I'll stand. Well, it's easy to talk what you're going to do in this nice, warm sanctuary, correct? But he knew Job would stand good. Because think about this. If Job had cursed God, can you imagine how embarrassed God would have been? Hast thou considered, my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a uh, perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? I call verse 8 the bait. God is, he says, he says the angels before the devil shows up, says, watch this guys. You ever see a guy who goes fishing his watch? I'll drop, I'll drop that, I'll drop that gate right out there. And it drops out there and man, bam, something hits it. He goes, watch this guys. It's, has thou considered right? Man, the devil went, the Lord says, got him. Verse nine. Then Satan answered the Lord said, doth Job fear God for naught? But, uh, hast thou, hast not thou put a hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath? Uh, on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and, and his substance is increased in the land. And now verse 11 proves this, that the devil thought Job was a Baptist. But put forth thine hand, now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. That sounds like something a Baptist would do. Guys, <clears throat> so he did. And um, look, at, uh, look at verse 13. And there was a day... When the sons of God, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the son, his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans uh, fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, guys, we call that bad news, right? He's lost all, he lost. But watch how, how often this appears. While he was yet speaking. So he just gets this bad report and says, uh, while he was yet speaking, verse 16, there came another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and it burned up the sheep and the, and the servants and consumed them and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, if those two reports just came into you, I mean one after the other, you say, well, I, I gotta, I gotta think about this. Uh, whatever you had planned for the afternoon, you might say, I, I gotta cancel the plans, but look what it says, 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote all four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only escaped alone to tell. Guys, this is devastation like none of us have ever experienced. None of us. This guy lost absolutely every single thing that he had. He lost, he lost all of his wealth. And, and you know, really guys, uh, you could say this, well, if I got to lose everything, but I got my kids. That's okay. But he lost them too. And look what it says, verse 19, or um, 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. Now, right about there is where he is supposed to curse it. And said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job said, Not nor charge God foolishly. And you can't see it, but right there between between verse 22 and where it says chapter 2, somewhere the devil goes like this. Oh, 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 man. Oh, what happened? It was sticking his eye. So look at chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and, and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Now, have you ever heard this? God believes in balance. Now, personally, I can prove from Scripture God doesn't believe in balance, but everyone likes to say that. Well, really, I mean, all right, you believe, you think God believes in balance? Because if he does, you guys need to go and get as many homosexuals into this church as you have non-homosexuals. Because you want balance, okay? But I can, I can prove, I, I got Scripture, I can show you he doesn't, he doesn't believe in balance. But everybody says God believes in balance, so I'm going to go with that. And when the devil shows up, he's got a black eye. You know what God thought? 
He's only got one leg. That's not balanced. I think I'll put a stick in his other eye. And it worked before. And he drops the same bait. And Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that doesn't like it, there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now my personal feeling is that right about the time the Lord said those words, don't you think the devil should have went, whoa, deja vu, I've heard that before, I've, I've heard that. But the Lord, he added to the bait, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, <clears throat> to destroy him without cause. And watch him take the bait again. Now, now I am not into catch and release, or when I do fish, I'm, I, me, it's just kind of universal release. I just don't even catch them. That way I don't have to release them. But I went fishing one time when I was pastoring with one of the guys in my church. He would take me fishing. I caught a fish. I mean, I caught a fish. I, well, I mean, anyway, I, I caught a fish. I, okay, <clears throat> so I caught a, I caught a fish. Uh, I caught this fish. And he goes, I'll, I'll get it for you, preacher. And he takes it off the hook and tossed it back in the lake. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, what are you doing? I said, you're not a catch release, are you? He goes, no. I said, why'd you throw my fish back? He goes, too small to keep. I thought, big enough to bite, big enough to keep. Okay, that's a primitive theology, but that's uh, that's what I think. And so, man, I mean, like, I caught about a half a dozen fish. All about, They're all brothers and sisters or whatever. You're all about that big. They're flying fish that day. Then I did catch a fish. I got some about that big. And I thought, well, that's big enough to keep. He takes off the hook. I said, what are you doing? I said, that's big enough to keep. He said, well, that'd be big enough to keep if we had some with it. I said, we had some with it. I threw him overboard. But if, if you were a fish, now, and, and, and you know, you see this really delectable worm, and you go, Jeez. And next thing you know, you're, you're being drugged through the water by your mouth, pulled up, something rips this out of you and throws you back in. If tomorrow you saw this really de delectable worm, wouldn't you go, uh, right? But the devil, he falls for it again. And watch this in verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord said, skin for skin. Is that not like a kid? Skin for skin, yeah, all the man hath. Will he give for his life? But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and curse thee thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his, unto his crown. And he took him a pot sure, to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Now, I want to say some, I want to read verses, uh, I want to read verse 9 and 10 on behalf of Job's wife. Uh, look at verse 9. It says, then, say, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. People, I do not know how many preachers I have heard rail on this woman for what she said. They say, well, that isn't a good thing she said. No, it's not a good thing she said. No, it's not. But didn't she lose everything she owned too? I mean, I mean, isn't this her husband? And when the camels went, they were her camels too. And when, when the sheep went, they were her... And didn't she lose ten kids too? And ladies, wasn't she a little closer to them coming to this world than Job was? I mean, would you think she might, might be having a bad day? All right? I, I do not, I do not, I'm not upset with this lady at all. I can understand. In fact, in fact, not only is, has she had a bad day, but her head, we're always saying, well, your head is your husband. He thinks he's going to die. And I'll prove that in a moment. So here it is. She's lost everything. She's got ten funerals to attend. And her husband thinks he's going to die. You think she's having a bad day? And he answered her, but uh, verse 10, But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So he set her straight. Hey, guys, you men, if somebody's got to set your wife straight, ought to be you. Okay? Do you hear that? Anyway. <laughs> she must. I needed, I needed some backup when I, I tried that. <laughs> but, the, hey, guys, you can't tell, but right there after verse 10, the devil is watching this. And he goes, boy, he's going to curse him now. And he didn't curse him. And he went, oh, oh, man, he got two black eyes. And I don't know if you realize this, but right there, 
the trials of Job are over. There is not another trial for Job other than the three idiots. There is not a trial. There's not a satanic trial. The devil doesn't come back. He's, he's had two black eyes. He's not going to mess with this anymore. And the trials of Job are over. If you stop and think about this, if his three friends, Larry, Curley, and Moe, did not show up, this book would be 40 chapters shorter. And I'm going to talk to you because this man was devastated. You have to be devastated. That's one of the things I tell people. You say, well, you know, me and Job, I lost my job today, and, and I go to the book of Job. Job didn't lose his job. He lost everything, including 10 kids. The closest, and this is not as bad as Job, the closest I've ever heard to anything like this, there was a Christian family uh, in, in Illinois. They, uh, they had nine kids. Three of them were at home. Six of them were in the, in the family van with the parents. They're driving down through Chicago on I-94. They hit a piece of metal. It punctured the gas tank. I mean, ripped it open. Gas just just exploded out onto the onto the asphalt or onto the highway, and and the the whole van burst into flames. And he got it off the road. Dad and mom opened the doors and bailed out. And it was a pool of fire. They could not rescue any of the six kids. They stood beside I-94 and listened to the screams of six of their children die as they burned. Now, that's tough. That's not as bad as Job, but that's tough. You know where that family is today? In church. My, my. That's some good folks. That's, a, that's somebody God put a stick in the devil's eye with. And so these, these guys show up. But I wanna, I wanna, wanna, what I want to do is we're going to look at some lessons from the book of Job, some things that when you go to the book of Job that uh, I learned. I learned from the book of Job. Uh, I want you to go to Job chapter 17. Job chapter 17, and the first thing I learned from Job chapter 17 is this. You may think that your grief is going to kill you, but it won't. I, I don't know if you've ever had anything happen in your life and you said, my life is over. There's no tomorrow. I, I'm not going to make it through this. Look what it says in Job chapter 17, verse 1. My breath is corrupt. My days are extinct. The graves are ready for me. You know what this guy says? I can't take another day. I've lost it all. Even my wife says, curse God and die. I mean, I'm just, I'm not going to live through this. And there are some griefs, uh, people, that, that come into our lives, and it is like, I don't think I'll ever get through this. I'm going to die. You know how many people have not died when they thought they were going to die? And I say that because, really, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know that we have had any great grief. We have never buried any of our children. There's one of them I really thought about it, but, but we haven't buried any of our children, and we haven't had a house fire, and we haven't lost everything, and, and our health is reasonably good, and we don't have it tough. And, and sometimes I, I really do, I, I'm, I'm kind of amazed. I think one thing about Baptists, I always say this about Baptists, they can snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. A Baptist can find every cloud in every, a cloud in every silver lining. I mean, Baptist brother, they worry if things are going good. I was teaching in a, in a Bible college back in the 80s, and I came into my class, uh, and one of my students came up, and he had that look on his face like the world just ended, and he just wants me to pray for him. That's a disaster has happened, obviously. And he goes, he goes, pray for me, brother, pray for me. I said, yeah. I said, what's the matter? He said, nothing. Everything's going good. I said, so what am I praying for? Well, you know, when things are going good, something bad's going to happen. So I slept. Me and John Calvin took care of it. We got past that. Don't you feel better now? But that's it. When things are going good, it's like, well, then something. I'm, guys, we don't, do you really have to look for something bad in life? No, no. I mean, the Democrats will, will, will fulfill everything you're afraid of. Isn't that true? They're going to destroy this place if they get the chance. And they're, they got the chance, and they're doing as fast as they can. But, guys, we have not had it as bad as this man. But, but all of us have probably gone through something where we thought, I'm not going to make it through this. I'm not going to live through this. The, the, the grief is going to just stop my life. You may think you're going to die from the grief. Look at Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. This man is prepared for die, to die. He said, the graves are ready for me. Now, mind you, he had, he had lived long enough to be married and have ten kids. Correct? And then, 
uh, God gave him, look at verse uh, 12, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, twice as many as he started with. He started with 7,000. And 6,000 camels, he had 3,000. And 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses, he had had 500 each. Hey, I preached this in Las Vegas one time, I said, double or nothing. <laughs> They're interested in that. He had also seven sons and three daughters. So God gave him double everything that he had. And look what it says in verse 16. After this lived Job a hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. You know one of the worst things we do? I'm going to say something. This is not scripture, but it's true. It's true. Time heals all wounds. Have you ever heard that? Well, it's true. Uh, and and here's, here's the principle. If I cut my hand here today, isn't this true? The moment it gets cut, it begins to heal. Yeah. And what happens? Well, you know, I put a Band-Aid on it, uh, and then it stays there okay. So I take the Band-Aid off, and I got a scab here. And then eventually the scab dries up and chunks off, and then I got this kind of a pink streak here of new flesh, and then that's gone. You can't even tell I'm out of scratch. You ever have that happen? Yeah. You know what our problem is? Now, imagine this. Here's what we do. Just when the, when the scab gets on there, we pick the scab off and keep the wound open. Could you imagine going into a guy's, into a church or someplace, meet a guy, and a guy goes, look, look what happened. Look, look at my injury. Man, that's bad. When did that happen? 2014. It happened now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. It looks like it's healing. That's what we do. Guys, there's enough grief coming. You don't have to hang on to last week's. And we will, we will, we will stay and, and park. I'm going to say some things. This may upset you. I can't help it. I don't believe in roadside shrines. I don't believe in them. Well, this is where Bobby died. Yeah, and you know why you put that there? So that every time you drive by there, you can feel bad. Every time you b drive by there, you can pick that stab. 1975, 1975, October 23rd. I had a brother two years older than me, and on that day he was coming home from work, <clears throat> uh, literally going around a turn in our area that is called Dead Man's Turn. Many guys have died. A good friend of mine died wrecking his Corvette in that turn years earlier. And my brother was coming home. Uh, I've been with him for five years. He was lost. He's coming. It's a downhill turn to the right, and then there's a, a mile-long straightaway. But he wouldn't wait till he got around to Bend to pass these two cars. So he jumped out in the left lane. Car came around him, hit him head on. He came down. He had a chopper. He came down over the handlebars, popped the gas tank. It, it ignited him. Him and the bike just slid off to the side of the road. And he's never quit burning. As far as I know, he's never quit burning. Unless he got saved sometime between, between that time and the last time I saw him, uh, he died alongside that road. And when we are in that area, we drive past that spot. And I never think about it. You say, why not? Because time heals all wounds, if you let it. But no, we've got to have the shrine alongside the road. So that every, or I, Hey, if I die, if I die, can I? I'm just going to help. No one has to feel like you have to dedicate the back window of your pickup truck to me. Now come on, think about it. Why does a guy dead, why does a guy put a dead person's name on the back window? Because they want to know how, how bad they are hurt. I'm telling you guys, I'm sorry, but we all play the violin. We all sing our sad song to play the violin. And guys, you got to let this thing go. And this guy lived 140 years after he thought he was going to die. You know, I've often thought, I've often seen Job. Uh, you know, it's like it's like maybe 120 years after this taking place. He's got 20 more years to live. He doesn't know yet. And his great 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 grandson, he's sitting he's sitting in a chair, and his great 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 grandson sitting on his knee, and his and his great 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 grandson says, uh, "Grandpa Joe, uh, my my daddy said that, that a long time ago uh, some terrible things happened to you, and and some bad men came in, and they said some bad things about you." And I bet Joe went like this. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not you say that. I I remember. Yeah, it was a, it was a bad time for your great grandma and I, and and uh, 
Yeah, we, oh, we got through it. We're just fine. Well, isn't that the worst thing that ever happened to you? Well, if you want to know the truth right now, the worst thing that's happened to me is this arthritis in my knee. <laughs> Guys, you got enough problems tomorrow. Let them go. Some people, brother, some people, they will tell you everything that ever happened to them. Well, you know what happened to me? I don't care. My pastor, I love my pastor. And and I don't know if all pastors, we always, you always get somebody that, that uh, you know, it's like they're a continuing open sore. And there was a guy in the church, and he would, uh, about once a month, he'd call the pastor and go, Pastor, I, I, I need to talk to you. You need to come and, and, and see me. I'm, I'm going to kill myself today. And so the pastor would go over to the guy's house, and, and he'd counsel him. And then a month later, Pastor, Pastor, you need to come over. Uh, I, I'm going to kill myself today. And one Monday, do you ever one of those days when, it was just a bad time for somebody to try to kill himself. <laughs> and he said, it was a Monday, and he said, just about every bad thing that could happen, it happened. And this guy calls, and he says, Pastor, I need to talk to you. You need to come. <clears throat> I'm going to kill myself today. And my pastor said, hey, um, could, could you do me a favor? Well, yeah. He said, I, I have got this. You cannot believe all the stuff I have got on my plate this morning, today. He said, do, do you think you could kill yourself tomorrow? And the guy goes, uh, well, well, yeah, I, I guess I could. He goes, you know, he said, it would, it would just really, it would just help me so much if you killed yourself tomorrow instead of today. Oh, okay, Pastor. Okay, thank you. He'd kill himself. He'd kill himself. Guys, guys, you may have some grief. And if you haven't had that grief, it may be ahead of you. And something may happen in your life, and you say, I don't think I'm going to live through this. Oh, wait, that's what Job thought. And Job, what he went through was far worse than what I am going through. We can't, we hate to think that somebody could actually go, go through something worse than what we're going through. But none of us have gone through what Job, none of us probably ever will go through what Job went through. Not to the intensity. And he thought he was going to die, but he didn't. Um, look at Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. Now let me tell you, I'm going to read Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 to you. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and the man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Uh, his substance also was seven thousand sheep, and three thousand camels, and five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred she asses, and a very great household, so that, he, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. He wasn't one of the greatest. He was the greatest man. I, I'll just read those three verses. And when you see somebody like that, you know what you think? Man, I wish I had it made like him. My guy, that guy ain't got a worry in the world. Look at chapter 3, verse 25. After all this stuff came upon him, it says this. Job chapter 3, verse 25. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. You may see somebody that you think has got it made. They got it made because financially or some business connection or their family is connected or whatever. And you go, man, those guys have got it. He hasn't got a worry in the world. This guy was the greatest man in the East. And, and he, was, he was thinking about, what if I lose this? Well, what if it all goes? Guys, we all have some kind of fear. And, and I tell people, don't go, don't. don't don't conjure up too much fear. Uh, George S. Patton said this, take no counsel in your fears. I, I had a guy one time, I told you, you know, Baptists, how they can always find something bad. And this guy came up and he said, uh, he said, I got this problem, maybe you can help me. So he told me this problem was, it really was not that tremendous. And it was not one that could not be fixed pretty easy. I said, okay. I said, well, I said, if this is what's going on, then you do this. And he said, well, well, if I do that, then what if this happens? I said, well, if that happens, then you do this. Well, yeah, but if I do that, then what if this happens? I said, well, if that happens, then do this. And no matter what, I mean, if I said, I'm going to write you a check for a million dollars, he would find some reason why he needed to. And finally, I just said, okay, I shall tell you what you need to do. Let's just kill ourselves. You first. 
But the guy just wanted to play the violin. He, just wanted, to, he wanted to find something bad. And, and don't, don't look out there and go, oh, everything's gone good. Something horrible is going to happen. Well, it probably is. But if you're going to sit around and worry about it, you're crazy. You're just nuts. Because some people worry about it, it never does happen. But this guy, if anybody would have thought that Job secretly feared he would lose everything, they'd have never believed. Or they'd say, well, why is he worried about it? Well, what are you worried about? I want you to look at um, Job chapter 1 again. Job chapter 1. And I'm not going to read any of this, but we just looked at it. In Job chapter 1 through 3, it told how rich he was. And in Job chapter, thir uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through about 19, it tells us how quick he lost everything. He lost everything in a day. Right? You may be secure, or you may see someone who is secure, and they can lose everything in a day. Man, that, that, you know what? Uh, when the uh, 1929 uh, depression started, when the stock market fell, no, I was not there. But um, people were jumping off buildings. You know why they're jumping off buildings? It wasn't. It wasn't just they'd lost everything. It was like they saw their world in, and they just couldn't take it. Read this sometime on your own. It's a horrible chapter in the Bible. It talks about the, if what, what God is going to do to Israel. He's telling them if you don't get right. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Don't read it now. But here's what God says. And you get, he, he says, I'm going to bring this curse on you and this curse on you. And you get, it's a long chapter. And about two-thirds of the way in, maybe three-quarters, and you're in about the last 20 verses of it. And he said, and you're going to see this happen. And you're going to see this happen. And you're going to see this happen. And he says, and you will go mad by what you see. Man. That is awful. But guys, you know, I, I've talked to people and you know, they'll say, well, I'm just doing fine. And I, I say it this way, and it's true for me, it's true for you. I don't care how tough you think you are, how well you can, you, look, you can compete against some people, but God is God. And I tell people, I said, anybody and everybody in this room, God has got a corner that will fit you. He just hasn't painted you into it yet. But I am going to tell you this. I don't want it to be true tonight. But any one of us, before the before 12 o'clock tonight, any one of us, God could have us on our faces begging him to help us get through what we just found out happened. You say, well, then I should be afraid. Be afraid of God. Don't be afraid of circumstances. Don't be afraid of, oh, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. No, no, just be afraid of God. You know, the, these, these liberals, they go, well, the Bible says, uh, you know, when it says to fear God, that's talking about, reverential trust. Actually, it's talking about fear. And those guys that think it's reverential trust, you know what I'd like? I'd like them to be in a line in a bank someday, and behind them, they hear, they hear a, a, a slide come back and snap forward, and all of a sudden, when they turn their head, they put it against the muzzle of a cold, nice steel forty-five caliber pistol, and he looks at the guy and goes, excuse me, sir, but you're filling me with reverential trust. <laughs> You know what that thing says? That's a God can't look. God, I told you this morning, God is keeping your your atoms together. He is keeping your molecules together. He is keeping the breath in you. God could drop this floor out from under. So you say, well, he wouldn't do that. There are some people in the Bible, there's been some people across history that have had horrible things happen to them. And so, you know, you say, well, what should I do? Thank God for how good things are. You know what you ought to do? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says what? With food and raiment. Be content. I don't know if you people realize this, but probably at least 70 to 75% of the world, when they wake up in the morning, they have two questions. How am I going to get food? And how am I going to keep it? That's the two questions for the day, every day. Now, I am going to make a statement. I, I'm going to assume I'm right. And I, I'm telling you, this is true for us. It's probably true for every single household that I am speaking to. You've got food and raiment. I'll bet everybody here, you've got more food in your house than you can eat one day. Now, for a Baptist, that's an amazing thing. I'll bet you this. I'll bet you've got more clothes than you can wear in one day. You know what that means? First off, you've got what you should be content with. But now here's, and I, I do recommend you do this sometime. 
You don't have to physically do it. You don't have to take a pad and a pencil, but if you want to, if that'll help you. But just start at your front door and thank God for everything in your house that you can't eat or you can't wear. You could start with the front door itself and the carpet and the floor that is under the carpet and the house where the floor is. And thank God for every single thing, everything you've got that is not food and is not clothing. You ought to thank God for it. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to find out. You're rich. By, again, by about 70% of the world's standards, the average American is wealthy. I heard a Korean many, many years ago. I heard this Korean preacher preach. And uh, they brought him over to this country, and they showed him a bunch of stuff. And guys, if you haven't seen this country, you're really missing something. It's a beautiful country. And this guy had been everything from uh, New York Harbor and saw the Statue of Liberty, and he saw the Grand Canyon, and he saw all this stuff. And they said, what impressed you about uh, the United States? What was the, what, the biggest thing that impressed you? You know what he said? He said, the biggest thing that impressed me was the size of your garbage can. He said, we could eat a month on what you throw away in a week. Guys, we're rich. We are rich. And so, instead of sitting, no, don't go home today and go, when's it going to happen? You know what I hope? I hope. Um, today, uh, we went out to eat after church, and we <clears throat> we celebrated the death of a cow. At a state. And, um, I think if I didn't have one the day before, I had one day, one day before that. So much steak, so little time. And you know the day may come when you're going to be starving to death. And you know I hope? I'm hoping, because I'm not sure I'm going to, I got what it takes. But I hope if the whole bottom falls out of this, you know I hope I say? Now tell me, if this isn't true for everybody here, I'll bet no one here can count how many steaks you've had. I'll bet you can't count how much ice cream you've eaten, how many donuts, cookies, how many times you just sat down with friends and laughed for an afternoon, laughed till you cried, laughed till you hurt. Guys, you understand how rich we are. And I'm not telling you to be afraid that it's going to end tomorrow. What I'm telling you is look at it today and thank God for everything you've got, including more food than you can eat in one day and more clothes than you can wear in one day. You ought to take a look at what you've got and instead, because that's what Americans are. I, I, I had this guy come to me. He's going to be one of those. Uh, he's going to sell me into one to get me into one of those pyramid things, you know. And and you know what they got to do? They got to make you feel covetous. They got to make you dissatisfied with what you've got. That's what television advertisements are all about. And so he's showing all these, you know, the good life and the yachts and these Cadillacs. And and I got at the time I got this little Chevy Chevette. Chevette. And he pulls in in a big old Chevy Caprice. And and he shows this whole thing, and he goes, uh, now, are you satisfied with that shit? And I said, I did. I said, starts every time to turn the key. I said, runs good. I said, yeah, I'm satisfied with it. He goes, really? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm not satisfied with that Caprice. I said, really? No, I wouldn't say he's bad. I said, good, give me the Caprice. Spread love here, buddy. <laughs> but, but guys, you know what we do? We sit down and all we think about is what we don't have and what we want. Instead, you ought to just take a look at everything that God has blessed you with and thank you for it, item by item. I don't care if you start with your toothbrush. You can't eat it, you can't wear it. Guys, I'm looking at a wealthy group of people. I really am. I am a wealthy man. I really am. And I thank God for it. If you've got good health, man, I thank God. I thank God. And I got some problems with my neck. I was having a, I was flying someplace, you know, Kathy wasn't with me some time back. The neck was really, uh, it was really a bad day. <clears throat> I'm on this plane flying someplace. And I said this to God. I said, God, I dressed myself today. I was supposed to be paralyzed from the neck down since I was 23 years old. That's like 100 years. And uh, I said, God, I dressed myself today. And I fed myself today. And I carried my own luggage. What am I supposed to complain about? You have no idea how thrilled I am carrying luggage. I, I am thrilled to shovel snow. I love shoveling snow. Everybody said, well, you shouldn't do it. You hurt yourself. I said, I pray every shovel. 
I do. I don't want to do. I don't want to be stupid. I lo- I've always loved shoveling snow, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll shovel it up. Go out, pick it up. I try to bend my, my my knees, pick it up right, do it all right. Say why? I just appreciate what God has given me, guys. And instead of, of being afraid it's all going to drop off or not being satisfied with with what we got and want something else. If you just look at everything you got and say, God, I can't eat this. I can't wear this. This is wealth. This is luxury. This is what you have given me. And there are people around this world, they look at your income, they look at your house, and they think they were in the wealthy people's houses. So, you can have it all, but it can be wiped out in a day. Uh, Take a look at Job chapter 6. Job chapter 6. And I think this is probably one of the funniest verses. I get, I get a kick out of it every time I, I, I read it. It, it just it almost cracked me up. Now, we know what happened. He lost everything he had. Then he lost his health. And his three buddies show up, and they start saying, well, you must have done something that God's doing this to you. Right? And he hadn't. He hadn't. And he's trying to convince them that he hasn't done anything. That I mean, come on. Didn't one of the servants say, the fire of God? You can't, you, you, know, you could say, well, the Chaldeans, they're evil people. They did that. Well, how do you explain the wind? They killed his sons, not thousands. God, God could go to the wind. And he's not under the judgment of God. And look at Job chapter 6, and look at verse 28. Now, now, I want you to picture him when he says this. He's sitting on an ash pile full of boils, thinking he's about to die. Now, therefore, be content. Look upon me, for it is evident, evident unto you if I lie. Well, if I saw a guy who lost everything in one day, and he's full of boils, and he's sitting on an ash pile, and he said, look at me. I mean, if I'm lying, you should be able to tell. And I'd say, yeah, if you were lying, I'd think maybe you'd lose everything in one day, and you'd have boils all over this sitting on an ash pile. I mean, isn't that what we expect? Isn't, that the, isn't Job the picture of what we think is the judgment of God? When the judgment of God at all. Yeah, his three friends, his three friends are like you. You know, here's the problem. We always go to Job, the book of Job, and we think we're Job, and more times than not, we're one of the three friends. Because every one of us, you, me, every one of us has had, 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 has heard something happen to some Christian, and we went, yeah, I know why God did that. You know why? I knew that was coming. Yeah, you know why? And maybe God didn't do it. But you, you know He did. That's what they knew. And so guys, don't be too quick on, on, on what you think happened to somebody because God did it, because someday something's going to happen to you, and it wasn't God. But somebody's going to say it was God. You know, when I broke my neck, one of the funniest things happened, uh, well, before I broke it, I had an argument with this Christian. And then I had another argument with another Christian, and when I broke my neck, both of these people said, God broke his neck because he argued with me. And in the worst way, you know what I want to do? I want to get them both in one room, give them a steak knife each, and let them fight out who God broke my neck. <laughs> really. But that's what happens. We, we say, oh, God's judgment's on him. But isn't it funny? What we think is God's judgment on him, if it happened to us, we just think it was the devil. Right? Uh, I want you to look at Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. <clears throat> And Job chapter 19, and there may be, uh, there may be something unseen here. In Job chapter 19, it says this, verse 13, He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance are verily estranged from me. My kinfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. You may think you're forsaken and abandoned, and you're not. Uh, I have a thing. Uh, I, I, um, uh, I have some people that are having some tough, tough times, and I'll text them or call them. But when I text them, one of the things I'll say is, you're never forgotten. You are not forgotten. And he's saying, my acquaintance. Now, now the three guys that came and gave him the hard time, how were they defined in Scripture? They weren't his brothers, and they're not described as acquaintances. What was the word? It's friends. Man, you need friends. Not like that. Maybe you need family and acquaintances. Because look at Job chapter 42. Didn't he say, my acquaintances have a, are strange for me, and my kinfolk have failed? Now look at Job chapter 42. 
And look at verse 11. After all this took place, as then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been his, there it is, acquaintance. You notice there's no friends mentioned here? The friends are accusing him. That's funny. His friends, I would think friend is, is, a, is above an acquaintance. But it's the friends who give him a hard time. And when he gets relief, it ain't any friend that came and did it. It's family and it's mere acquaintances. All they that had been his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him, every man also gave him a piece of money and every one in hearing of gold. Have you ever questioned this? How much time, time, how much time transpired from Job chapter 1 to Job chapter 4? Now, I've had people say, well, it'd be years. Well, I don't think it's years. If you think about it, Job chapter 1 and 2, boom, boom, and it's done. The, the, job, the trials are over. And if you start reading at Job chapter 2, verse 11, when the friends show up, okay, we know at least seven days went by because they sat there and stared at it. But then after that, once they start talking, it's, it's dialogue. I don't think they did this. I don't think... I don't think they said something to Job and make a charge. And Job says, uh, okay, uh, I will answer you three days from now, court adjourned. I mean, they're going back and forth. And the entire book of Job, all the things take place, they're said, could take place in a day. It could all go by in a day. So how much time went by? Well, to answer that, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You don't have to verbally answer them, just in your brain. Um, if you have a brother or sister who you, you have good fellowship with, you love them, and let's say they live in Texas, and you go home tonight, and you get a text, and it says uh, your brother's house burnt down, and he lost his kids, and he lost everything. Now, let me tell you what I think is going to happen. You're going to be at the airport tomorrow too, aren't you? You're going to get to Texas as fast as you can. I don't think you're going to say, well, I think I'll hitchhike my way down to Texas. Said, no, no, no. You're not even going to drive. You're going to get on a plane, and you probably know what you're going to do. You're going to say, uh, let's make sure we got some, some money in the checking account, because I'm going to have to write the check when I get there. In other words, when, when the people that we love, the people that we want to help, when we hear they have a problem, we take care of it as soon as we hear. Um, when we get back, I've got, a, I've got a preacher. He's dying. We're going to do something for him, okay? It's, it just needs to be done. We can't do it until we get home, but as soon as we get home, um, off it goes. But Okay, no telephone for Joe. No internet for Joe. So I think this. I think the entire the entire book of Job probably took about one month. Because it probably took about a week or two for the word of what happened to him to get to his brethren. Maybe it took three weeks, and maybe they only took a week to get, to get there. Because when word came to his brothers and sisters that this disaster had happened, you know what I think some of his brothers said? Yeah, they told the servants, hey, pack my bags. We're, we're headed to go see my brother. And, and get about, uh, get a hundred sheep out there and get some of the cattle and get some of the camels. I'm taking my brother. And so you may think you're forsaken by your friends and you're not. But that's, it, part of that forsaken stuff, it's almost like we like that. It's almost like we were, nobody cares about me. Why, when, when Elijah went out, when he's going to run from, uh, uh, from Jezebel, he left his servant and then went out to the wilderness. You know why? Because he's going to feel sorry for himself. And the servant would say, stupid, why are you feeling sorry for yourself? You just killed all the prophets of Baal. And why are you going to the wilderness? Because where he's at, it's raining. It's going to be green and pristine here in about a day. And he wanted to be where he could play the violin and feel sorry for himself. And guys, you're not forsaken. You're not forsaken. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I got a, I got a, uh, I got a phone call when I was pastor. I was up in New York and a, a pastor, <clears throat> a friend in Ohio called me. And he told me about this pastor that the church was ro rose, up, rose up against him. They're trying to run him off and they quit tithing and tried to starve him out. All I had, all I had in my wallet was a hundred dollars. It took a while to save that up. So I sent it to him. And, um, I've never met this guy. I wouldn't know him if he walked in the door, okay? But I sent it to him. <clears throat> and I got a, uh, 
Uh, I got a letter about two weeks later. He, he thanked me, but it was uh, it was kind of neat because he said this. He said he said thank you for the for the money he sent, but he said the biggest blessing. So here's what I told him. I said uh, because he was having trouble. I said here's what I'm saying this hundred dollars for. First off, I know he's going to tie it, so he's got ninety bucks. I said. It's a designated offering. Now, you guys know what a designated offering is? That's why I give you money and tell you how to spend it. I like that. Because I told you, I gave, I gave, we gave some money to a missionary to take a vacation, and he didn't use it for that, and he destroyed his ministry. And so I said, here's what I want you to do. I said, I want you to take this money and take your wife out to eat. Just go to a nice restaurant and enjoy a meal. And I, I don't think you can eat $90 worth. This was back in the early 80s. I said, I don't think you're going to spend this whole thing in the restaurant. So after you're done eating, go to the mall and buy your wife a dress. He said, oh, you knew his wife. I don't even know her name. No. You know what I know, though? What I knew? I knew that he is going to get through this. You know why? Because he's a man. He may go behind the barn. He may say some things to God that about two days later, he's going to go back and say, I'm sorry for what I said. But a man is going to get through it. But it's harder on a woman. It's always harder on a pastor's wife. And so I thought, let's get her through this, and, uh, and, and he'll be okay. And so I get this letter from him, and he said, um, he said, thank you for your, what you sent us, but he said, the biggest blessing was your letter arrived on April 18th. Well, April 18th is like three days late for taxes. I don't know what April 18th is. It doesn't mean it for me. He said, April 18th is our wedding anniversary. And he said, because of the problems in the church this year, I didn't have any money to take my wife out to eat for anniversary or to buy her a dress. Now, I am about to tell you guys something. You are going to be so glad you came to church. Ooh, you're going to be so glad. You know what we're always trying to do? We're always trying to tell you what to do. You know what? You preachers, you're always trying to get us to do something. All right, I'm going to tell you something to do, and you're all going to do it. You are going to obey. Here's what I want you to do. Between now and next Sunday, go to your favorite store, men. Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop, you know, hardware store, ladies. Hobby Lobby, Joanne Fabric. Anyway, here's what you do. Go to your favorite store and spend $100 on yourself. Buy anything you want. Ooh! You can go do it and say, I'm doing this because I'm a pastor. A preacher told me to do this. Right? This is your chance. But uh, there's no there's no hook in this. Well, other than maybe 90, because this guy would have tied this, we would have had 90, but 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 just go spend hundred bucks on yourself. Buy whatever you want. Just remember this. If you get exactly what you want for hundred bucks, you will not get the joy that I got spending a hundred dollars on somebody else. My, my, my family was Roman Catholic, and <clears throat> I witnessed to him after I got saved, and witnessed to him, and witnessed to him. Twelve years after I got saved, my dad and mom got saved. I got a preacher friend and pastor, raised Roman Catholic too, dad and mom Roman Catholic, and twelve years after he got saved, his dad died in town. I called him up. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm backslid as hell. He said, I don't think a preacher ought to talk that way. Neither do I. So I called all our friends. We broke fellowship with him. I, we don't have fellowship anymore. Well, isn't that what we do? Hey, Job's wife said something she shouldn't have said. But she might have been under a little pressure. And guys, let's have a little grace with each other. And I looked in my wallet, and all I had was two twenties. I didn't have a hundred dollars. So I put them two twenties in the envelope, and I said, you and your wife go for dinner. Take, go to a restaurant and go have a meal. About two years later, I was on, on that side of the country. I was having a meeting with him. And he said, brother, that $40 kept me in the ministry. He said, you'll never understand when you got that $40. I said, well, I'm telling you guys, don't forget them. I know we always say, I'm going to pray for you, but sometimes I think that's our cop-out because prayer doesn't cost us anything. And sometimes I think, you know what you ought to do? You ought to write your prayer request on the back of a check for about 250 bucks. Send somebody something and, and say, I want you to know you're not forgotten and you're not abandoned and you're not, you're not cut off. 
all right? I know of three people. I don't know how you, again, you know, <clears throat> I don't know what you count. <clears throat> I don't know what you count as success. And if it's a deer, okay, that's fine. Or, or uh, you know, the number of zeros on your check. You know how would I count success? I got, I got two threes. I know of three churches that were going to close that I got to keep open. Now that, I count that as success. I know three men who are going to kill themselves, and I stopped. And never knew it. Never knew it. Just thought about it. You never know. Sometimes you just need to give somebody a call and just say, well, you know, God laid you on my heart. That's what you know. I love you. I think about you. And that you're not forgotten. And this guy thought he, he thought he was abandoned. He wasn't abandoned. It just took a while for the word to get out and the family and the acquaintances to show up. In our economy and in our society, you could be there overnight. Isn't that true? They couldn't have traveled that far. And I think the whole thing took only about a month. I've only got a couple more. Uh, look at Job chapter 12. And I want you to know, Job is fighting almost for his life with these three guys. The object of all fights is for one side to say, you win, I give. And Job wanted those three guys to say, okay, Job, you're right and we're wrong. And they wouldn't do it. And they wanted Job to say, okay, guys, you are right and I'm wrong. Right? And this guy, now think about it. I mean, you're fighting with three guys while the boils are running? You ever had a boil? I had a boil when I was nine years old. I still remember the pain. This guy is covered. So he is in agony. His wife it says, curse God and die. He's lost everything. And he's got to go back and forth with not one guy, but three guys. And it's hard to whip three guys. And look at what he's doing. Look at, look at him <clears throat> trying to hang on. And, and here's what it is. Who want to tell you? The next point, you should not give in when you know you're not wrong. Now, I said when you know you're not wrong. I didn't say when you know you're right, because you're always right. I mean, you're always right. Well, I'm right. I just know I'm right. But there are times when you know you're not wrong. If If... If your house burns down tonight, like right now I'm talking to you and your house is burning, and tomorrow morning three of your friends show up and say, what did you do that God burned your house down? God didn't burn my house down. I did nothing. Well, come on now. They just don't. Well, what did you do? Why did God judge me? I didn't judge me. If you know it's, it's not that, don't give in. And look at this, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1. Job answered and said, no doubt that you're the people and wisdom shall die with you. Man, I think that that's a slap. That's sarcastic. This guy has got boils all over him. He reaches out and goes, oh, yeah, you guys, man, when you're gone, wisdom would be gone. You are the you, you are the three lights of the earth. Look at this. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, what? Who knoweth not such things as these? I am as one mocked of his neighbor who called upon God, uh, and he answered him, uh, and the just man and upright is laughed to scorn. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Lo, mine eyes <clears throat> hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. He said, hey, you know, I want to tell you something. I know that. that is, I know what you're, well, you know, you know, Job, God judges people like this. He does things like this when they're, when they've done something make him mad. I know that. That's what he's saying. I know what you know. And he says it again. And I know he's desperate. He said, I am not inferior unto you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty and I would desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace and it should be your wisdom. Man, I mean, this guy is slapping them. He is hitting them. Uh, look at Job chapter 30. Verse 1. But now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs on my flock. <laughs> I like Job. I really do. He is caustic. He's saying, I wouldn't let your fathers feed my dogs and you guys come and get in my face. That's what he's saying. But he knows he's not wrong. Or he does know that. 
And there are times, guys, I don't mean that we're always right. I just mean when you know you're not wrong, don't give in. Look at Job chapter 42 again. Job chapter 42. And this is the most, most amazing thing. Now, uh, I, I think you guys probably agree with me. I, I don't mind trophies. People win trophies for something. But I'm not into this participant trophy. You know. Well, what did you win this for? I, 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 uh, I was on the football team and I played uh, end guard and tackle. I sat on the end of the bench, guarded the water bucket, and tackled anybody that came here. I mean, participant trophy? Well, we want him to feel like he's, he's, he has a value. He doesn't. Let him play second base. Let, take him out where second base belongs and have him lay down there and play second base. And he will have a value. You know, I can't get over it. So take this little four-year-old. I saw this four-year-old kid with a helmet on, football helmet on. And he goes, will he realize his dream? That ain't his dream. That's his old man's dream. That's his old man's. You know? And then you go, well, you know, you need to have a dream. That's why we got a whole nation of dreamers. We're not getting anything done. So, God likes a winner. And Job's three friends must have been Baptist. Because when they couldn't, when they couldn't win the argument, they left. Is that not Baptist? And now, now think about this. They walk away. What do you think they're saying? They wanted him to say, you guys are right and I'm wrong. He never said it. So what do you think they're saying? Hey guys, I'm really worried about him now. I mean, Look what God did to him. There's nothing left. How is God going to do? I'm afraid of what's going to happen. What's going to happen to him next? Because he wouldn't listen to us. We tried to help. And so they're walking away. And, and God says, you know, I need a winner here. And, and Job thinks he's right. And these three guys think they're right. And I need a winner. And so God says something to these guys. And he says it over and over and over and over four times just so they know, just in case they might not quite understand. Verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends, for you not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job. Therefore take unto you now seven bullets and seven rams, and go to my servant Job. And offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job will pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Whoa, you think they who knew who was right? Now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I tell you, you ought, to, you ought to enter the scene that you're reading, and maybe you don't see it the way I see it, but I see this. They left. Now, here's Job. Next day. Here they come again. Oh, no. They thought of more things to say. This book is going to be longer than Psalms. I mean, haven't you ever done this? Haven't you ever argued with anybody and on the way home thought of what you should have said? Green! <laughs> you just, that's what I should have told them! And he's thinking, that's what they did. They thought of more things to accuse. Oh, no. They've got cattle... They're going to stampede them over me. I saw this on a Western. And they show up. And, and I think they probably apologize like all liberals apologize. Here's how a liberal apologizes. If they say something that's just horrible and godly and unfeeling and intolerant, they'll say something like this. Uh, if there was uh, what I said, if there's anybody who's too stupid or so stupid that they were offended by it, uh, I'm sorry. That's how they do it. And so I can see him, you know, I can, I can see Eliphaz come up and try to smooth things over. Hey, Job, old buddy. How you doing? Hey, scabs are looking a little better. <laughs> yeah, you know, Job, uh, <clears throat> when, when, when we were here uh, the other day, uh, well, I sure hope you didn't misunderstand and, and think that we thought God was, was, like, punishing you. That's exactly what they And I think about that time God said, tell them the truth. Uh, Job, God spoke to us. You're right. It wasn't the judgment of God, and we're wrong, and we're sorry. 
we brought these to offer, but God said that he won't forgive us unless you pray for us. Will you pray for us? Now, I'm sorry, guys. But I mean, after what they put him through, I didn't pray for him. I said he prayed. But, I mean, where you got him? Wouldn't you take a few minutes and go, Oh, you know, you know, you know, guys, I was thinking about what you said. And yeah, I, I am really a miserable person. I, you know, you don't want somebody to pray, like, like me to pray for you. I, I just get you more trouble. Oh, no, Joe, no, no, we, 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 uh, you, the, the Lord said you gotta pray for us. We, we need, oh, no, guys, no, no, you don't, oh, you, you can go find some spiritual person to pray for. You don't want somebody like me to pray for. Oh, no, Joe, no, 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 Joe, it's gotta be you. You, you've got to pray. Please pray for us. Oh, guys, no, I don't know if I could pray for you if you got down on your knees and begged. No, I don't think he did that. But that's because it's the book of Job, not the book of Sam. Because I'd have had him. But you know what I learned from Job? You should even help your tormentors if you can. You should help the people who hurt you. If they're the brothers. I knew a young man and uh, a, a preacher did some things intentionally and hurt him greatly. And about 10 years later, that preacher had some problems. And the young man knew that this guy hurt him. I mean, he knew it. And about 10 years later, this guy, the, the guy that hurt him, was going through some grief. And the young man sent him some money. He said, why would he do that? Why wouldn't he? He's a brother. Do you understand that hurting you is like not hurting God? You guys... Um, I, I don't. Uh, I, I know we don't. We don't preach this, but we all practice it. You know what the sin unto death is? To disagree with me. That's the unpardonable sin. No, not to disagree with Sam Gift. All Christians think that the that the unpardonable sin is to disagree with them. And once you've done that, I've often said this: if there was a church member and they were mad at their pastor, and they're downtown, and there's their pastor, and there's the devil, and they have a gun. And they got one bullet. And they can take out their pastor. Imagine if you could drop the devil. Imagine how many people would live. I mean, if kill the devil, who knows? There might not even be a Democratic Party left. Think of the good you could do by killing the devil. And if a guy was mad at his pastor and he's downtown, the devil would get a pass every time. Because when they get mad at somebody, when we get mad at each other, we hate them more than we hate the devil. And you know what Job did? I mean, think about the angst and think about the agony. Think about the desperation when he's going, I am not inferior unto you. And then they come back and say, pray for us. And he did. You see, that's why he was the man to do the stick. I am telling you guys, I think all of our corporate character put together, we don't come up to Job's knees. Job's knees. This guy was something else. Look at Job chapter 42. And in verse 12, we already read this, but this is where he got twice as much as he had before. Here's, here's what I learned. You may think you'll never recover, yet you can. He thought he was going to die poor. He thought he was going to die, and, and really, it had taken him a lifetime. And he probably thought, well, if we've seen our best days, it's over. And he ended up with twice as much as he started out. And, and something may happen. You go, well, I'll never recover from this. Yeah, you can recover from it. I know you feel like you can, but you can. And then here is the most remarkable one. Job made it through, right? With no help whatsoever. Uh, there wasn't a, did you lose all your cattle? Did you lose all your sheep? And did your kids all die in one day? Support group. Uh, he didn't say, well, you know, I, I'm taking this back. I, I'm taking this kind of hard because I'm a melancholy. I mean, the guy had no one to turn to, and his friends are charging him with folly. Isn't that true? He, he made it through. He didn't have one written word of God. You know what some of you, if, if what happened, if you could, if you had 10 kids 
and you were as wealthy as Job, and you lost everything on one day, I'm going to tell you what you would do. You'd be reading Psalms that night. Wouldn't you? Well, we'll go to that book of Psalms. Well, he didn't have Psalms. He didn't have the book of Job. He didn't have anything. Just he knew this is a good God, and he'd always tried to serve him, and he thought, I don't know why this happened, but I know it didn't happen because that God is angry with me. And I'm sticking with my God. That was all he had. Now, here's what I say. If he can make it through without what we have, why is it we can't do it? You know, I got the, uh, <clears throat> I got the two fight on books back there. And they're, they're, they're basically one page stories. Some of them are two or three, but most of them are one page stories of people that got into situations where, uh, they could have died, maybe should have died. There are military situations, anything from the Polyanic Wars to the Gulf Wars. There's, uh, plane wrecks, shipwrecks, uh, train wrecks, floods, lizards, earthquakes, volcanoes, grizzly bear attacks. I mean, there's some horrible things happening. And people came through. People got through it. You know what? And now I like, and they're not survival stories. They're about people that just said, I'm going to try. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do this. There's a, there's a story about five sailors. Their, their ship was sunk in the Pacific. And, and they washed up on shore. And, and the one was very, very badly injured. Obviously, he's going to die. And the, they, they didn't want to do anything. They had no food, no nothing. They had, maybe they had a little bit of food, but. But they're, they're literally, he, he knows they're waiting for him to die so they can bury him and then they're going to take off. And he finally said, guys, just go and take the food. I'm going to die. So just go. I'll be okay. I'll die. And so they did. And, and they left. And this guy laid down and said, I'm going to die. And he woke up the next morning. He said, okay, well, I didn't die last night, but I'm probably going to die today. I'm going to die today. And he didn't die that day. Well, okay, I'll, Probably going to die tomorrow. I'm going to die tonight. And he woke up the next day. And he said, after, this is what he said. He said, after about four days, I decided to try living. And I hadn't had anything. And so on that day, he reached up to a plant that had a leaf. And the, the morning dew had, had pooled in the leaf. And he pulled the leaf down to his mouth and he drank it. And he felt a little, a little sustenance. The guy nursed himself back to health started a one-man war on the Japanese that, that, that were, were on the island. He, you ever see the movie where they're going through the jungle in, in file and a guy gets in the back and knocks off the last guy? This guy did it. And then finally, um, they were after him. They, they realized he was around somewhere, and he knew they were going to get him, and he saw a submarine offshore, and he was able to signal it, or a plane, and they sent a submarine by, uh, and he got out that, air, uh, that submarine, this guy survived. And the other four guys never heard from him. The other four guys never heard from him. Now, you know, what's, you know what bothers me about that? You wouldn't even say it. You know what bothers me about some of the stories in Fight On Books? These guys go through this stuff, and they're not saved. And we have this book that comes from God, that we love, and every word comes from God. Oh, I love God so much. And then something happens, and the first thing we do is close the book and drop out of church. And we can't get through what a lost world can get through without our God. This guy got through this, people. Now, I know this. Look, if, I, if something like this happens to me and I don't get through it, I am telling you I could have. It is my failure. It is not a failure of this book or this God. You understand? And so when I read this book, what I realize is that this guy got through with nothing. Not one promise. I don't know if you ever thought about the promises of God, but if the promises of God are really good, if, if God is God and his promises are so reliable, you only need one. If God's promises are reliable and infallible, you could claim one all of your life. You say, well, then why did he give so many? Because he know you won't claim one all your life. You'll get tired of it. So he gives you another one. And he gives you another one. Man. Now, now I want you to think about this and I'm done. Uh, think about some time when you thought, I can't make it through this. 
And then you're reading that book. And something in that book spoke to your heart and you got through it. Think how Job would have felt if he got, got a chance to read that verse right in the middle of his book. He never had that. And he got through with twice as much and one of the most famous men in Scripture. I learned a lot from this book. I know I am nothing like this guy. If God were to put a stick in the devil's eye, I'm probably not the guy because I would probably snap. I'd probably say something stupid. Okay? Job was something. When I see what Job could get through and everything that takes place in this book, I know I can make it through anything. I didn't say I will. I said I know I can. If I don't make it through, it is my failure and my weakness. It's not, it's not a flaw in this book or unfaithfulness of this God. I'd like you to stand with your